Oh, welcome everybody back. I'm impressed uh, in these times. Uh, the fact that all of you, uh, I think practically everybody who had joined the last class is still here. So um, I assume that uh, that's a good thing. Um, before I start, uh, there are two questions. One that um, was everything that we'd covered in the last class, is there anything that since in the last one week uh, was something that anyone has a question on that before I start the next thing? Um, you can either chat it or you can um, unmute yourself and ask a question if there isn't. I'll give you a couple of minutes and if not, uh, we will move forward. Okay, it looks like there is nothing. So, uh, so today what I'm mostly going to cover would be uh, starting from some uh, data file. Uh, we will import the data file. Uh, again, we will go back to some part of the slicing and dicing. And one reason why you have to do it is because um, oftentimes your data could be either much bigger than what it is, or you might have to put it into some kind of a binning process. And that binning process requires you to be able to uh, choose what you want and then do some kind of a processing on that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, 50 minutes uh, class is not sufficient to go in pretty deep into it, but I have tried to come up with some kind of uh, um, not very rudimentary, but still uh, somewhat of a simpler structure, uh, which should be able to guide you forward. Um, and then hopefully we will be able to cover it uh, something deeper than that uh, going forward. So the library that these days for a lot of data frames is used is pandas and you can see if you uh, if you see on my screen this is what you should be seeing it um, incidentally the uh, the gentleman who wrote uh, Wes McKinley who is the core Python uh, pandas developer has also written this brilliant book uh, called Python for data analysis so uh, the book is available as it is uh, for free um, you can download the PDF and you can also uh, download its codes and uh, if those of you who are um, not familiar with this book, I highly recommend it. It's a brilliantly written book. It starts with a very simple analysis. And most of what I am trying to do would follow a similar structure, if not identical, because the goal of this book is uh, somewhat deeper than uh, what I'm trying to accomplish here. So with that, um, the second reminder is that uh, you remember that I had shown you this uh, core this this dump of my uh, things uh, I will be uploading the Python uh, to here soon um, later uh, after the class but the data is where uh, all the data is down here so if you click on here you will see that these are the data files and not necessarily all of them are the one that I am working right now um, I actually want to ask a technical question that might help people get started in the future yes. mm -hmm. um, so in, in order to get the data file to to replicate this, I just clicked on the data file in the notebook you shared and downloaded it and ran it in a Jupyter, a local Jupyter notebook. Is yes. there a way that I could run it on Azure by cloning? In, in other words, is there a way that I can copy the entire file structure uh, of your project into my own Azure notebook as opposed to only the notebook itself? I'm just a little unclear yes, about Yes, you that. should be able to. I, I, if you go down here, uh, and if you are on the Python, unfortunately, and this is one of the odd part of this is that uh, the clone that you will have will not reflect the update that I do. And so the only way to do it is that then you have to go to terminal. And if you click on terminal, this opens a Unix terminal and which is basically um, let's see when it runs uh, here. So this is the terminal and here if you do the uh, LS you will see that this is where the library is and you have to CD to library and then uh, you go there and now if you LS what would happen is that you will have to then uh, re-clone it because if you down if you make another clone that's the new clone it wouldn't reflect what was if I change it. If you don't want to do it, what you can do is that you can always click on these files, say these, um, and then you can download the project. And if you download the project, that will be a project as it stands at the point when you accessed it. So then if you download it, every time I update it, the update will be the newest update and you just download the whole project. And then this will be preparing. And uh, here it is. And now it will be a zip file which let's say if I do it here on the desktop, if you go it there 
and then you go to folder and then at that point you can just unzip it and uh, extract all and now if you do this whole thing as soon as this is unzipped here is the whole thing and so now you have the entire data available to you um, the files would again like I said the 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 the, I, the note the notebook files they would not be there because this would have to be changed every time but I'm not going back and changing that file that I've loaded so if you want to if that's how you want to do it you can have it here when I do the intermediate Python 2 you just download that file file and now put it in the same place and now you should be able to run it so if you want to go let's say you want to go to your anaconda here um, let's see so uh, I guess here. my question is that what you're talking about here is essentially downloading the project and then running it on like a local anaconda instance so yes. is there yes. any parallel way of like just running it in your own Azure notebook or it's yes. downloading? Yes, uh, so there is a way to do it. So yeah, the one way to do it would be this. Uh, let's say that I am right here, right? You start uh, on this file, so you just clone it. So you clone this and at that point, this now becomes a functioning file for you. This whole thing becomes, um, let's say, give it a sub name other or whatever you want to call it. So now, um, Okay, so I think I get it. I, I was thinking that when you cloned it, you were only cloning the notebook, but you're actually cloning the entire file structure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you you're do entering. that, and then you use like dot slash, and then the directory name, like the directory structure that you showed in your examples will be preserved in yes. my clone of the project. Yes. Okay, great. I'm Although, uh, the one thing, and good that you brought it up, uh, those who are not familiar with it, it's actually, the directory structures are easy to trace back because what the way it happens is that if you were doing it, if the files you can locate, uh, so let's say actually, let's go back to here. So let's say that you were trying to do, um, you start with this, so your uh, read CSV is here, you put it into two of these uh, colons, uh, these two uh, thing, and you hit the dot. Now, this requires a little bit of you to remember how the Unix systems operate. Your first dot is your current library. You do this, and now if you hit tab, it tells you what folders are within that. So you do this now, let's say that you have located it somewhere else, you can just go another dot, and that would be another level above that. And by doing so, you go to this and then you locate wherever your file is. So in my case, this was a Lime file. So I just run it that, but, um, and if there's a confusion on that, um, feel free, we can, um, we can have a session on it if you can't, uh, if you can't locate your files, uh, but it should be able to run. And when I have the file finally uploaded, that one, that clone would then give you the whole updated NIST lab, uh, file that I'm working on and that should be able to. Uh, that so we could on. like delete the clone and then just go back to your notebook and clone it again and everything would be updated. Yes, unfortunately that's the only way for is so what we'll have to do is that if you go down here, uh, you'll have to actually remove that. So if you do, uh, like I said, let's see that this is what we have, right? So what you would have to do is that in your library then uh, you will have to uh, delete that project. And so that would be um, here. So you have this, uh, you will have to remove you'll have to remove in the library, uh, you'll have to remove that project. Intermediate Python and those individual files that you can keep because I'm not gonna change any more data, but if I were to, I would probably uh, let you know that. Does it, does it make sense? Is it clear? Great, I think this is helpful. And then if people wanna go back and try to like replicate this, they can, um, they can watch the video, so great. Yeah. But the first one that we will be starting today would be called this lime.csv. And that is, that is, comes from uh, the CDC data. And so uh, it's a, Lyme is a disease that uh, has, the incidence of that has been growing up in the last uh, dec two decades or so. And uh, oftentimes um, there are certain diseases that can be seen as indicator of uh, changing climate. And Lyme is one of them. Uh, because it's a very common uh, vector barn disease. In fact, it's one of the most uh, common vector barn diseases in the United States. It is caused by a bacterium, which then itself is transmitted to humans through the bite of a uh, tick called a uh, black-legged tick. Um, to begin with, um, if you go so, back to, sorry, yes, could, Steve. Could I interrupt for just a second? So just, uh, 
if people want to get to the data set, um, if they go to the lesson schedule, um, there's a thing called Azure Notebook link. And if you click on that, that takes you to the intermediate Python um, folder that Sanjay's in and you can click on data and that's you where the file is that he's talking about. You should be able to right click or click here and then download it from here, download uh, file. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so like I was saying, uh, Lyme is a disease and uh, because it is, uh, it is transmitted through these ticks which require a good combination of humidity and the warm weather. And uh, because as the time is going, as, we, as the seasons are warming, as the climate is warming, those ticks now have a much better uh, propensity to stay in their young phase and, and that's the phase into which uh, they, they are more active and so you go out and you are bitten by this and then you get the Lyme disease. So it can be used as a good proxy for uh, measuring the climate change and that's the premise onto which uh, this uh, analysis that I'm trying to do uh, would be going. So the first thing we do is we import the library. So if you all can um, follow me along, uh, like I said, I hate the idea of actually giving a pre-made notebook, but if you are interested, uh, if people want it, I could have done it. But if not, please follow along and if you're a good typer and if you can type it well, uh, live coding, um, you could, uh, could go ahead and do it. So you, the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna import these three libraries. NumPy is a core library, it's a numeric Python. And as we always do, we import it with an alias. So we import NumPy as NP. Then we import the library pandas as uh, its own alias PD. And these are standard aliases. You can give anything, but if somebody else is reading who's not familiar with your alias, uh, he will have a problem. And then this third one, which is the plotting library, uh, those of you who have an understanding of the, uh, either the matplotlib itself, or if not, those who come from the, uh, uh, from the other uh, packaging, you'll find it very familiar. So this is the import matplotlib. And from there, we are getting particularly the pyplot component, and that's why it is matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. And then this last one is, uh, it just makes sure that your plots are, generated within the uh, within the um, uh, on this notebook so from there um, uh, so from there then we uh, we move on to the next stage so we import this here as you see here we import it um, and uh, next is just the description and so if you have this file uh, you will be creating a data frame out of it so we go to the D df1 pd dot and if you notice here and that happens for all of these things. So if let's say that if we have to do it, uh, you're gonna do df equal pd dot. And if you push tab, you will be able to see all the options down here. So you choose the read and then you can down it in here and you can hit it. So that's what we're gonna do. We, uh, we have this, uh, we're gonna import this file called lime.csv. And as a, as a practice, whenever you import a file, the first thing you want to see is the first couple of rows of that. And the procedure to do that is head. Um, you can give either a specify how many you want. So you can give either a first two rows, or if you don't, if you leave everything here, it will give you the first five. Um, let me show you, if you don't have this file already, I would highly recommend you to download it. But if you don't, let me um, go to this file and show you how it looks like. So. This is one of the simpler kind of files. Uh, it's a comma separated value. So you can see that between the entry and the next, there is a comma. Uh, it also is one of those better files where you have the, the header or whatever the title is supposed to be for the column is already written down. Um, it's a good practice to have them, but in the real life, this may or may not happen, especially if you happen to download this file from an instrument or something which doesn't give you. But, we will start with that and then uh, we will see if there is a time left for us to deal with another simpler but somewhat of a cryptically written file. So this is a file. Um, you would remember that the pandas uh, generates these uh, files with its own indexes added up into it. So because we did not provide any index, which we wouldn't normally, um, it has given them a simple zero to going forward. Just like head, you can see the end of the file, which is always a good practice. So we do this and uh, we get the tail and we can see that the data is from 1991 going all the way to 2014. This is not the most latest file that either I have it or it's available. Um, you could, if you had data, you can add it, uh, but we are not gonna do that. It's always good to do a sanity check 
because oftentimes if you are dealing with a data frame and if your data type is not matching to the requirement, let's say that for some reason these years were come as a character because one of them was mistyped or something, there is always a good possibility that your uh, in individual data types would not match with your expectation. So we do that. And as you can see, as expected, uh, the pandas has parsed the file logically. Your year here has come up as a number, which is an integer number. And then you have the incidence rate, which is the occurrence of per 100,000 people that has come as a float, which you will expect it to be given that it is a decimal value. It would come as a float. So that, that part is right. Um, one of the common thing that you do with when you have a file, when you have these columns, you generally do some basic statistics. Uh, not that the only thing you do, but this is one of the common thing that oftentimes you do. Uh, one of the things, so if you have to do these statistics, let's say that in this case, there is nothing to do on the year. Maybe at the most you wanted to have a count, which in this case, you already know that there is data worth of 23 year, uh, 24 years. But let's say we want to have mean um, average incidence rates over all these years. There is a whole set of these uh, methods that are available. And what we're going to do, what you can do is that you can chain them. So I follow this, this method and there are two methods. So we can, if you want to extract a particular column from there, either you can have, so remember we have the call, uh, data frame called DF here, DF1. Some people prefer to have a dot notation, which is available in Python. It's not available in R and other uh, methods, but here it is. Let's say that if we do it here, and if I do this, you will get uh, the entire number of years come as a series and you get them as like all. Um, the problem that happens, if you look back on the top, our column here is listed as incidence rate. And in that case, your dot notation would not work. So what then you have to do is that you could use what is called the parenthesis notation. And in that case, you wouldn't have this dot. What you will have is it under a square bracket and now you have to give the square bracket as a character string. So now if you do the same thing, you will see it exactly the same way. So the choice, whether you use the dot notation or do you use the square bracket notation, sometime comes how your columns are named. When it is not the case, people have personal choices and the Python community, as some of you would know, uh, it's pretty divided between whether you should use the dot notation, which is somewhat of a convenient uh, notation method. And not only that, the advantage is that if you had the dot and you did tab, it will give you some of these methods list listed into them. So there's a confusion as to how you should go around, but um, I would leave it to your own personal uh, devices and your personal choices, how you do it. I prefer uh, the square notation. I like it because it's more readable. Uh, but don't take it uh, to be any kind of uh, affirmation of one way or the other. So we extract this incidence rate from the column, uh, from the data frame. So we got the DF1. I'm using the square notation. As I said, that's my preference. And also because if you had a name like this, you couldn't have used the dot notation. And then you chain it to whatever method you do. So like in this case, we want to have the mean. So here it is. Um, if you wanted, say, median or uh, min, how much is the minimum value is, you just do it min, and here you get the minimum, and so so on and so forth. So you can chain, and there is a whole uh, lot of method available, and you can look it into it, the, the documentation. So that's that's one of the simple things. Um, but before we go to that, uh, remember, I, I last week I was trying to cover this part, but it couldn't happen. Um, some of you might be familiar. If you're not, I will. Uh, this would be a good refresher that. There are two ways to slice a data frame. One is what is uh, called the lock and the other is I lock. And what it is, is the lock here is just the locator. And this is a label locator. Whereas the I lock is an index locator. So what it does is that what these methods do is that they utilize the index or the location, which is the index label and try to find that particular thing row usually as a default into the data frame. So let's let's look at the first example. You would recall that your data frame here, the first entry, which is the zero index entry is the year 1991 and there's an incidence rate of 3.74. So if you utilize the I lock method here, this number zero is the index of that row, 
which is the zero index. So if you do that, you basically get the very first entry, the topmost entry, which is the year 1991, and forget about why it is doing it as a float, um, and then gives you the incidence rate. So if you were to prefer, and you remember I showed, told you that you can use the head, which gives you by default five. Sometime, um, and depending on what your personal choice is, you can actually use something like that. And so what you could do is that you can have the DF1 I lock and you give the number. And what basically this is, is this first colon refers to the number of rows that you want to go. So what it is doing is that, uh, remember I said the last time that the zero here is implicit. So what it is, is starting from zero index and then stopping at the fifth index, this is what it is. So this is how you get the value from there. Let's say we wanted to get from five to 10. So you go from five to 10. And now in this case, this would be the sixth row because this is zero index and then it stops at, so here you get like that. If you were to say, um, uh, or actually, just let's say, if you were to say, choose every second column, you have a big data set and you want to have a look at how the data are laid out, uh, you can then use this double colon here. So what this first says is this is just this much will give you uh, values until the 10th row. So you start from zero to 10, but the second one tells you what are the hops. So now if you do this, you will have every second one. So you can see that this is the zero row, and then you have the second and fourth and so on. Um, when it comes off, using the columns, you can follow the similar procedure. And remember here we had just the colon. So the first one in this case is implicit. What it means is that you have the zero implicit colon five that tells you up to the fifth row, but there is a comma and that is missing there, which it, what it is is that all of the columns would be given. But let's say we wanted only the first column. Um, so only the first column, uh, sorry, not the first column, but the second column, this would be, and this would give you uh, the data frames by the index locator, all rows and the second column. Let's say that we wanted to do a header kind of thing. We want the first five and only of the first column, this gives you the value. Now, the reason why we utilize these methods, why would I prefer iLock uh, versus the named column notation method or something like that, would primarily be because my column names are very cryptically named. Let's right? say that I have incidence rate. It's a long thing and we all are uh, not surprisingly very lazy people. We don't want to write um, all of that name, using the iLock saves you spacing. If you know which number of column you're using, uh, you can get the first rows and that. Now, before I move from iLock to lock, I need to get a simpler data set. So here is a very simple data set that I just created. I have a column one with the val entries of one, two, three. Then I have a second column B with the values 10, 11, and 12. And in this case, I am, so let's, let's first see how this would look like. If I just create this data frame, this data frame gets column A with the one, two, three values, and we get the column B with the 10, 11, and 12. And the indices are filled in default zero, uh, starting from zero and going back to one, two, three. If I provide the index, so I provide the index, which is now in this case is A, B, and C, this data frame would look, which will have the indices as A, B, and C. This is where the I lock and lock method begin to look very distinctly different. So remember I said that the, in the I lock, your I is the index, which is the, uh, the index number. So this is your zero index. This is the first row with one index and this is the two. If I have I lock, you will notice that what I'm gonna get is the row with index B and the value of A as two and the value of B as 11, that is as expected. Now, if I have to look for an index, the value where it is B as it is, we don't know. I mean, it's a big column and I have no idea. Uh, let's say that this would have been a data frame of hundreds and thousands of entries. I really don't know which one I'm looking for. The one thing I didn't tell is that the indexes have to be unique. So now if I know that I'm looking for the value B in the index, I can use the label locator, which is the LOC. And here it gives me this value. Now, if it didn't exist, let's say that we were looking for D that didn't exist, Python will 
uh, tell you that that's not correct. And basically what it is going to tell you that the label D is not in the index. So that's the benefit of that. And there are other uses how, how we can use it. And one of them is that if you were to look for uh, numbers from a certain range to the other range. And what is happening under the hood is that basically you can extract the value of indexes, indices from the data frame. There is an index method that runs. And so if you do these test data frame that we generated, and if you just did the index, it tells you that these are the index. From there, we are applying under the hood a method card called get locator, and we are passing this B. So basically when you're looking at the test data frame locator B, it's basically providing a get loc method onto the index. And by doing so, it is giving you this B. Now, what's the value? Why, why do you think we need to care about it? One of the reasons why we care about it, that let's say that in this data frame, we wanted to find exact entry which had the B value equivalent to equivalent, 11. So what we do, we have this criteria. We want to look for in the column B where the value is equivalent to 11. So we do this test data frame. I use the square notation to take extract that column and then I look for what is the value 11. And by doing so, it goes through row by row to every entry. And what that does is that then it looks at and generates these Boolean values. So the first one was not 11, so it's false. Second one is equivalent to 11, so that's a true value and because it's a small data set. So the third one is false. What we are doing is that we are passing this row as a slicer and that is now being, so we have the same criteria, the same Boolean criteria that we just generated. Now we are passing to the lock method. And when we do that, what it will do is that now it will return only for which this value is true. And by doing so, we get that entry back, which is the index B and then the column A is 2 and B. So this becomes a very uh, useful method to extract from a big data set based on the criteria that you provide. So we go back to the line data set. Remember, this was the data set from 1991 to 2014. Let's say we want to separate things before the year 2000 and after the year 2000. So what we're gonna do is just the same way, if we pass this data set a criteria which is below 2000, it's gonna generate a true false um, indexer. And then if we pass this as a locator, now this will return us part of the data frame which is before 2000 and after 2000. So this is after 2000, and then we similarly, we will have one for the before 2000, which we can do it in this case here. So we can use that and we just give it df1.lock. And now if we do it, this is the year. So these are the years before 2000 and these are the years after 2000. Now, of course, when I did do a mistake here is that you can, in this case, you can actually have it greater or equal so that 2000 will be there because we were missing the year 2000. So we got the 2000 here. So now we have split up our data frame into these two numbers. And now we can look at what the mean values were. Uh, so I will use the same kind of a, a procedure here. Um, I use that and now I want to look at the mean. So I'm asking a simple question. If the temperatures are changing, has there been a difference in the average number of cases of Lyme before 2000 and after 2000? So the criteria that I just generated, I have taken this and I'm looking at off that new data frame, which is this kind of a data frame, I want to look for only the incidence rate column and then I provide the mean and this is one of the simpler ways. And as you can see that after 2000, the average incidences are about twice that were before 2000. Now, of course, this is one of the ways how you can begin to then parse your data sets and begin to ask those things uh, in a, some kind of a, a meaningful uh, insight from that data. The other thing you would notice that, and this is, uh, this is the thing now here, it's a very big value and most of us really don't care for these decimals value going to uh, infinite numbers. So of course you want to round them off and you don't want to round it off by thinking or by secondary inferences. So what you do is you can apply the method. And the reason why I'm showing you is that I want to, to 
hammer this idea that Python is something that you should to put to your advantage by knowing things so it rewards you for your laziness. You don't have to do something. And that's the whole point of reproducibility that you're not thinking anything else. You're utilizing the pre-built methods to do things for your requirement. So what I'm doing now, instead of this long winding number, what I will do is that I will add a method round and I'll tell it that I want only two decimal points. So take this whole thing. We have the DF, we have the locator, we use the slice and then on this slice, um, we then extract the column incidence rate. We get the mean of that and we round these values to its two decimal point. And here it is, we have 7.85 and before to after 2000 and before they were 2000 so that we can come up with a clear cut answer that yes the incidences the lime have gone um, almost twice uh, after the year 2000. Um, if you really want a lot of statistics you don't have to do mean mode median separately there is a built-in describe method you apply that describe method on that and here it is it gives you a good number of pre populated values which are usually seen. So you have the how many total, so as I said, we knew it, these are 24 years worth of data. Uh, it gives you the mean uh, incidence rate. This is the standard deviation. The minimum value was three. And then these are the quartiles. So you have the 25th quartile, you have the mean, uh, which is the median at seven quartile, and then you have the 75th quartile, and of course the max is 10. And you can uh, look into the documentation. Uh, if you have a better data set, you can also do correlation and other things quickly onto that. So that's about the basic descriptive statistics. Let's move on to the plotting part. Given that we are using the matplotlib and there are other fancier methods to do it. Uh, CBARN is a very good library that makes much more elegant figure. Uh, we will see if we can cover it somewhere down the line in this uh, session. But starting with the very first method, we will just use the basic plotting function. And that is very simple. At the core of it is very simple. You just do the PLT, which is remember we have imported the matplotlib pyplot library as its alias called PLT. So you do the PLT and you call for the plot, which is the simple line plot. Uh, and that's what we're gonna stick it. We are not gonna cover the rest of the scatter and box plots and down the line. If some of you have a specific need and specific requirement, send me an email and um, I'll see that we can either cover it down the class or maybe in some next iteration. So we go this, plot. And now we have to provide, as it happens in any graphing system, you have to provide an X value and we have to provide a Y value. So in this case, we're going to provide the DF1 um, because that's our data frame. We're going to cover, we're going to um, do year as the X and then we're going to do uh, the incidence rate as as Y. And if you just do this, if you do nothing, uh, given that we already have the embedded uh, working, this will generate you a plot. But as everybody knows that this is not a good plot because it doesn't tell you what these things are. It doesn't tell you what this is and rest of the thing. But if you really want to have a very quick look at the data, this is, there is nothing that beats the regular Python in terms of a quick data making. So long as your data is numeric or a numeric like structure, you are providing it a proper thing. This is a quick library. So we got that. But let's say we want to make a graph that is better. We need to provide, we need to ask what the legend is. We need to label the X value and the Y value. And at the minimum, we want to provide a title. So these are the methods and these methods are pretty straightforward. Under that plot, I add the legend. Uh, and I leave the value if, because I'm not changing anything here in the legend. So I'm using the default legend, which are the column headers. And I then pass on the value, the labels uh, by as a string. Um, you can type it whatever you want. Um, and then you do this and then you do the title. And now if you do it, here is your good looking, um, properly labeled graph without normal uh, things that you would have to do if some of you are not using Python for making graphs. I think this is the minimum you can do to start making your graphs on Python. I find it extremely fast, extremely quick and reasonably well done graphs without much hassle. And of course, as you go deeper, you have a lot of control on what do you want to do with these lines? Do you want to change them into color? You want to have this thickness and uh, you can if you have a multiple lines, you can give them whatever kind of shape and structure you want. So 
for the next couple of uh, cells, we will work on the line attribute. Um, and for that, I would not use this plot. I would, I would generate some kind of a data which is easier to understand and easier to uh, show up here. So remember in the beginning, I had called for the NumPy library as its own alias NP. So I'm gonna use that and it's a very good numeric library. It gives you a lot of control on numeric processing. So I'm gonna use that and I will generate two Y data set. I will have an X data and I'll have a Y data. And X in this case is a value which goes from zero to 10 spaced equally between zero to 10 by 1000 numbers. And that's the np.lin space 0, 10, 1000. And then what I'm gonna do is that I would use somewhere down the line, I would also have a Y value for which I have a sinusoidal of that X. So I pass it as np.sine. What the NumPy does is that it generates a thing called NumPy array which is slightly different from regular pandas system. What it is, is, is a matrix uh, of just the numbers that are no indices. So this is slightly different. And in that case, when we pass it np dot sign x, it takes every single value and does a vectorial conversion of that to sign. And we're gonna use that. So now go back to the regular Python that I just told you, you have this plt dot plot, I provide the x, and in this case, the y value, I'm not using that, I'll come back to that. The Y value is that I subtract a zero from there and I'm just going to create these equally spaced value between zero, one, two, three, and four. And you can pass on the colors, whichever your preferred color is, and you can pass them by all kinds of things. There are a lot of named colors, you can just call them blue, red, green, whatever. You can also have their short color system. Um, so instead of writing, again, be as lazy as possible. So don't say the whole blue, but just say B. Of course, it doesn't work for all the color. If your fancy color is uh, chartreuse, you can have chartreuse by C. So you got to come up with the name properly. You can also use the grayscale num numbering and grayscale is zero is perfectly black, uh, zero is, is perfectly white, black, one is perfectly black. You can also provide their hexadecimal values or you can have a range of colors undefined which the matplotlib will then interpret by itself what it means and will just change it to one. Or like I said, if your favorite is Chartreuse, you can provide its HTML color number, uh, which is also accepted. So if you do this, you will see it generates a beautiful sinusoidal curve, each of them by its own definition. And so uh, you're not limited by the default uh, boring looking blue that the matplotlib does, but it, it is a pretty pleasant to eyes, so it's not terribly bad. It does a good job. Now, here all these lines are simple, boring, sorry line. But if you wanted to, you can actually do these lines uh, by their uh, system. So you can have, um, if you want them to look like solid, you can have a solid line, you can have a dash line, you can have a dash dot or dotted. And if you don't want to say all of that, then you can just say solid like this. You can have a two dash dashes, you can have a dash dot, or you can have a dotted and this will generate you a line similar to that. And here you have a range of these values. If you change the color and the line type, you don't have to do it in two steps. All you have to do is chain those methods. So here we have a solid green, you have a dash cyan, or you have a dash dot black, or you have a dotted red, and it's exactly the same way. It will generate you these uh, dash dot lines. So now, having introduced you how you have a control on these line types, we go back to the original plot that we had generated. And now what we're gonna do is that we are going to uh, go back to that figure and now I will modify it a little. So remember in this original case when we had this, uh, sometimes people don't like it because you are starting your axes from 1990, but your data is not until 1991. Or you have it 2015, but your data ends at 2014 some people don't like it. So you have the control on that and you can actually change it here on the limit. So you can give the plot X limb or Y limb. So let's go back to this. So now we have the X limit from 1991. Let me first show you what would happen if I just did that. Uh, so I'm taking exactly the way it was, but I'm changing the limits from 1991 to 2011, 2010. Something bizarre is gonna happen, which uh, sometimes uh, is very annoying. Remember, we had these values imported as the integers. So what 
Matplotlib's default setup does is that it doesn't understand that these values have no other value other than the full value. The solution to do that was that given that these were years, we could have imported them as a date time value. But date time comes with its own inherent problems. So you have now two choices. If you want to treat them as the way they are, but you don't want this odd way of saying 1992.5, which the Matplotlib has decided, what you can do then is that you then pass on these ticks as a definition. And those definition in this case, I have chosen that, okay, I want my ticks to be only at 95, 2000, 2005, and 2010. And if I do that then, then this graph will change from there. And now we have only the values of 1995, 2000, 2005, and 2010. And similarly, you can go and control uh, what are the other minor values are. And so you can do that, but then one of the ways you can do it is that you just add uh, blanks here. So if you do the blanks, then nothing will be printed. And uh, this should give you, oh, okay, I know why, uh, because you need to have a blank value here. So, uh, but anyway, the point is that um, you can provide those blank values or there are other ways how you can uh, change those things. And I would uh, hold on to those uh, modifications because what's more important is oftentimes uh, when you're doing these graphs and I have found that in the regular graphing methods, if you're not using Python, um, changing things on a graph, you have to add a notation. You have to, you have this descriptive statistics that you want it to be shown on the graph. Oftentimes, the only solution you have, you make your graph somewhere in some graphing package, and then you extract it, and then you edit it outside. But you don't have to do that because Matplotlib will support your entire uh, LaTeX uh, structure. So the way you do it is that you add this plot.txt, plt.txt, and you tell it where you want the text to go. So the text, in our case, I'll choose it to at the year 2000, and I'll, this is your X value and this is your Y value. So on the Y value at 5.5, I want this random number and this is, there is no nothing number here. I'm just making it up. You want to have its uh, mu, which is the average value, the mean value of 100 and you want its standard deviation to be 15. What you do is that you start with this R that tells you that now you have a text being inserted and this dollar sign or the dollar string converts that number, the mu, to its own related LaTeX value. So let's first do what, well, let's see what happens here. So if you just do that uh, and you see the graph, you will see that now we have a value written down here. So your, uh, your mu or mean is now printed at that place as 100 and your standard deviation is 15. So that becomes very useful. Let's say you wanted something else. Let's say you want an arrow to be made there or other notation, they are supported too. And the way they are supported is that we go to this other thing called plot annotate. So we have this plot annotate. And in the plot annotate, we tell what we want. So let's say that we wanted to remind our viewer that at 2000, we have a new century. So we say new century. And then again, we tell X, Y. This is slightly different from the other one. Uh, you don't have it by comma separation like that. What you're telling it, the X, Y equals. So I have an X, Y at the year 2000 and at value 6.2. And the 6.2 is very arbitrary. It's only for aesthetics. And you will see what does it tell. And then we tell at the X, Y text that we want it, the text to be placed at this location. Again, it's an arbitrary. But what it is doing is that it is pointing an arrow towards that and then we want it to be black and we want it to be uh, 0.5 thickness. And if you do that, you will notice that it generates this arrow. So you, this new century starts at 2000. And this is why these values are arbitrary because you have to come up with your own choices. So I could have had it um, seven. Um, so if I, if I have actually this seven would not do it. So this is going to be because the text will then be right there. But uh, let's say this, let's do this. And we do this at 7.5. And if we do that, here, this moves up. And so that's what basically what we are trying to do. We're trying to find an arbitrary value where, uh, and that you will have to do a couple of iteration. There is no automated method, but now the arrow is longer. And so now this graphs look pretty good. Uh, this is ready for publication. And uh, we can export this plot. I'll come at, at the end, uh, tell you how to export it. You have all kinds of choices. You can have a JPEG export. You can have a PNG export, which are ready to be printed as it is. 
if you want to modify these outside, which sometimes I have to do it, um, you can import them as a PDF and then the PDF you can call into Illustrator and on Illustrator then you have a full control because they would be exported as the vector files and you can edit them and you can type them on the fly. If the new century was not correct, your boss said or somebody said, your reviewer said that, oh no, this should be year 2000, you just can quickly type it, although it's a lot faster doing it in Python. So this was a data. Um, was there a question there? Okay, so let's stick back to, so we are, uh, so here, um, what I was gonna try to do is that I was gonna bring uh, another data here now and see how we can add another data set on top of it. And the one of the data that I was gonna do it, uh, let me at least try to finish through this uh, data file because the plotting probably we'll have to continue on the next week. But um, so this is another of the indicator. We talked about Lyme is one of the indicator. Uh, West Nile virus is a mosquito barn disease and um, it's pretty common in the Midwest and the upper Midwest um, because it is transmitted by mosquitoes. So those cases go up in the summer and just like I said for the Lyme, because now the summers are warmer and longer, the incidence rate and the range of uh, West Nile virus is also increasing. And, and the, the data files, uh, they come from CDC, so you can go back and get the CDC files there. Unfortunately, those files are not quite ready to use, so you need a little bit of wrangling, and uh, we don't have time to cover on that. But before we go to that, let me look at this particular file, because that file is a little more complicated than the file that I showed. So the West Nile file, here is the file. This file, if you see, it comes with all this extra material. We have the title, and we are, so unlike the line file, which was very clear, now you have to take care of these extra thing. And the way you do it is that on the pandas, you tell, this is your file, but you have to skip the first seven rows because we don't need those seven rows. Those rows are useless. And the column also, remember in the last time I had this odd name, incidence rate, which was gap with something. And that was very difficult because you couldn't use the dot notation there. So what we are doing in this case is that we are skipping those seven rows and we are providing the name of the column. We're telling it it's a year and I call it now WNV underscore incidence. And if I do that, now I get a data frame just the way I would have wanted. Now this data frame, now I have one data. So in going back to the matplotlib, we have the matplotlib.plot. We plot both of them together. So we have the, the first one, you have to remember what you call. So the first data frame is DF1, year, and then Y is the incidence rate. For the next, we have the year, we have the West Nile virus incidence, and everything else stays the same. And here we get a plot automatically. So now again, if you have your data files in multiple places, you can still put them together and make a graph. Unfortunately, this is not a very good looking graph. So the end of this graph, the way I want it, is something like this. So I'll just quickly go to that. Um, but uh, I would like to continue next week on how did we reach to that. But this is your graph. You have the Lyme cases on this axis. You have the Zika cases on this, each of them color coded and a title. And then, like I said, at the end that if you want to, uh, you would be able to uh, save these files. So if you want, whichever one you want, if you want the, as a PNG, you can just save fig as the figure, whatever you want to call it, .png. Uh, you can have it as a PDF. Now, if you want it to go to a certain place, then you will have to give it the place, let's say the data. And now uh, if you give the directory structure, the file would be uh, saved there. But I will hold on to that uh, for a while before we uh, finish it up. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, just a quick thing uh, next week because when we're gonna do the, the uh, data analysis and fitting, we might need these uh, uh, special axes. So is there any other question um, on this? So I know you've got to run. I will post the video on the, um, the, the schedule uh, on the landing page. Um, do you want to make this a notebook available also? Yes. For people? Yeah, so, yes, the so notebook can... would be available. Um, I will upload it in the next half an hour or so as soon right. as I'm done with the next meeting. Um, so, and they could be able to play it with that on their yeah. own. OK, great. All right. Anything else? Somebody has a question before we uh, move on or we leave. Probably not. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll, we'll meet again next week for the next part.
Sure. Thank you. All right.